exactly two miles away from where these two lines will soon intersect. The biggest oil discovery in the history of Western Europe is about to be made. The only problem is the two miles are all straight down. June 13, 1962, Bartlesville, Oklahoma. In a room containing only maps, charts, and geologist reports, a decision is made that will either directly or indirectly affect the lives of millions of people. A decision that will eventually involve the expenditure of nearly two billion dollars. Looking back on it now, I'd say our overall estimates regarding the North Sea project were pretty much on target. Of course, the exploration for oil is at the very best a gamble. We therefore elected to proceed with what you might call cautious optimism. May 1963. Phillips scientists and engineers, using high frequency seismic soundings, carefully chart the structure of the earth below the floor of the North Sea. Not one, but many large basins are located, thereby confirming prior geological opinions. August 17th, 1965, Oslo, Norway. After years of further study and negotiation, an international consortium headed by Philips Petroleum Company, which now includes Petrofina, Ajip, and Petronord, is awarded exclusive license areas in which to continue exploration of Norwegian territorial waters. The seaport city of Stavanger 175 miles southeast of Oslo, is selected as the best site for base operations, and construction of warehouses, docking facilities, offices and homes is immediately begun. Soon thereafter, Phillips scientists and engineers, along with their entire families, are moved to Stavanger from various other company installations the world over. But families aren't all that was headed for Stavanger in September 1965. So were tons and tons of equipment. Daily progress reports are sent to Phillips offices in both London and Bartlesville, where computers correlate an up-to-the-minute analysis of this vital information. Week by week, month by month, the pieces fall into place. Until finally, on March 15, 1967, the Ocean Viking, a semi-submersible drilling rig, is christened, and the long-awaited search for oil in the North Sea begins. deeper the bit makes its way into the earth below. The waves reach a height of 50 feet. The winds gust up to 110 miles per hour. Finally, on June 15, 1968, in sandstone, 9,600 feet below the ocean's floor, the discovery of natural gas, as well as vital liquid hydrocarbons, indicates the probable presence of oil. Other holes are quickly drilled. Crews work around the clock in spite of the wretched weather that inevitably comes with the bitterness of winter. But 
oil is not to be found. Finally, all drilling is suspended, pending further instructions. November 30th, 1968, Bartlesville, Oklahoma. To be perfectly frank, there were many of us, including me, who felt we ought to just take our lumps and get out. We'd already spent a good many millions and there was no assurance, whatever, that we were getting any closer to what we were after. Nevertheless, the judgment was made to try just one more hole. Surely the drill penetrates Danian limestone more than 10,000 feet beneath the ocean floor. Samples of drill cuttings indicate the limestone is heavily saturated with oil and gas. Soon thereafter, the first commercial crude oil discovery in the North Sea becomes a reality. Within a short time, three successful confirmation wells each one capable of producing over 10,000 barrels a day from 700 feet of pay thickness in a field eight miles long and four miles wide, established Ecofisk as the largest oil field ever discovered in Western Europe. Furthermore, the oil is lab tested and found to be high gravity and low sulfur, the latter an extremely important consideration in an ecology conscious world. By mid-1970, three additional oil fields are discovered, Tor, West Ecofisk, and Eldfisk. And in 1972, Edda and Abushel fields are discovered. The problem now becomes one of getting the oil from two miles beneath the ocean's floor up to the surface in as efficient a manner as possible. After carefully weighing all the possibilities, it is decided to try something never before attempted. A jack-up drilling rig is successfully modified so as to act as a temporary production platform. But it is not until early February 1971 that its 150-mile journey from Stavanger Fjord to Ecofisk is begun. Twice during the 20-day trip, Violent storms forced the crew to stop and jack up their strange-looking cargo. Finally, however, it is positioned in place and soon receives the more than 500 tons of equipment necessary to convert it into a separation and production platform. This diagram shows how the oil flows directly from the wells to the separation and production platform, after which, by means of two long lines, it is piped out to large mooring buoys. Rubber hoses are then run from the buoys to the waiting tankers, which are loaded on an alternating basis. Of course, it's one thing to make drawings or build models, and then presume it'll work just the way you planned it but it's something else again to try and put it all together in the middle of the North Sea. Phase two calls for the construction of drilling and production platforms, a gas reinjection platform, a field terminal platform for separation of oil and gas, a million barrel storage tank, 
a living quarters platform and all the other lines and equipment necessary to support a literal city at sea. Giant jackets constructed in various seaports around the world have already been set on the bottom of the North Sea. Still other components, constructed in Norway, Italy, France, Scotland, England, and Holland, are also being fitted into place. Piece by piece, Bit by bit, section by section, it somehow all goes together, in spite of the unrelenting fury of the North Sea, a fact that weighs heavily upon the day-to-day -day decisions of those in charge. Around the clock, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the oil continues to flow until finally one of the wildest seas in the world becomes too rough for even ships to hold their positions and everything comes to a halt. <music> Meanwhile, in Stavanger Fjord, a giant storage tank capable of holding over one million barrels of oil and weighing nearly a quarter of a million tons is nearing completion. In addition to its function of storing crude oil in order to minimize tanker loading downtime until the oil pipeline is operational, the tank will support approximately $150 million worth of oil and gas processing, communications, computer, and pipeline compression equipment. At the same time, the ocean bottom at Ecofisk is carefully studied to make absolutely certain of optimum conditions for setting the tank. Still another team meticulously plots the zigzag 298-mile towing route through the many small coastal islands and across the deep Norwegian trench, since 80% of the tank's total height will be below the surface. Buoys are placed every 656 feet all the way to the open sea, since even the slightest possible error could mean an incalculable loss. Finally, at 2 a.m. on the morning of June 19, 1973, one of the world's biggest towing operations begins. Sonar equipment on both sides of the tank, as well as on the pilot ship two miles ahead, keep depth conditions under constant surveillance. 34 hours later, the convoy arrives at Bakna Fjord, gateway to the open sea. Once again, weather conditions are carefully checked before the one and one half mile per hour journey to Ecofisk begins. Nine days later, on June 30th, 1973, in water 230 feet deep, the $28 million offshore storage tank, the largest ever built, is safely lowered into place on the floor of the North Sea. But even the most carefully planned operations are not without some misfortune. In this case, the loss of a 220-foot bridge section between a support platform and the tank. However, it is salvaged, repaired, and reinstalled in less than six weeks. By late 1973, nearly 1,800 men are directly involved in the Phillips North Sea operation. Not including an additional 1,700 men whose job it is to lay the 220-mile crude oil pipeline from Ecofisk and the 268-mile gas pipeline from Ecofisk to Emden, Germany. The oil pipeline, 
will soon reach Teesside here, where it will cross the beach and then continue on to storage tanks further inland. The line itself will be entirely underground. And all areas will be restored to the same condition they were in before construction work began. Total cost of the Teesside facilities alone will exceed $350 million. The extremely difficult job of laying the underwater oil pipeline at a cost of over a million dollars a mile is handled by three different contractors, representing well over half of the entire world's total deep sea laying capacity. inch pipe is 40 feet in length and weather permitting an average of 100 joints or a little over three quarters of a mile per day is painstakingly lowered to the ocean floor. As part of the required supervision and inspection the pipeline is continuously photographed by an underwater closed circuit television camera. A towed sled behind the lay barge uses water jets to cut a ditch beneath the line and to cover the pipe from three to 10 feet deep. In some locations, the jetting fluidite is immediately buried. In most cases, however, it will be some time before sediment carried by seafloor currents will backfill the ditch. At the same time work is being completed on the 220 mile oil line to Teesside, the 268-mile, 36-inch gas pipeline from Ecofisk to the $60 million facility at Emden, Germany, is well underway. However, until the gas pipeline is operational, all produced gas is being conserved by injecting it back into the Ecofisk reservoir. The final phase of this incredible two and a half billion dollar project will connect all seven fields. Cod, Ecofisk, Tor, West Ecofisk, Eldfisk, Edda, and Abushel to the central terminal facilities at Ecofisk, at which time an estimated one million barrels of oil and an estimated one billion cubic feet of gas per day will begin flowing to an energy hungry world. As I look back now to the very beginning, the very first time we even contemplated the looking for oil in the North Sea, and then I look at what we've accomplished in a few short years, I can't help but marvel at what the mind, muscle, ingenuity, and spirit of man can achieve if only he is given the challenge.